the UDL in 15 minutes logo with the text UDL in blue and tan above the words in 15 min in red orange all within a gray bordered circular frame followed by Patrick McGrath a content middle-aged man with graying beard and hair wearing glasses and a white t-shirt smiling against a blurred stone and greeny background Hello, and welcome to UDL in 15 Minutes, where educators discuss their experiences with UDL. I'm Louie Lord Nelson, UDL author and leader. Today, I'm talking with Patrick McGrath, a head of education at Text Help specifically focused on Europe, Middle East, and East Africa. Patrick and I are going to discuss the question, can we grow UDL organically? Welcome, Patrick. Hey, Louis. Thanks for your lovely, warm welcome there. I'm very, very excited to be on your podcast today. And thanks for having me. Oh, thank you so much. And it was great to meet you in person a few months ago and then for you to say yes. So thank you. Thank you so much. I'd love for you to start by giving the audience a brief introduction about yourself. So what's your background in education and with UDL? A close-up of hands using a stylus on a touchscreen laptop with a focus on the device and interaction in a blurred classroom environment. Yeah, so I have been focused very much on what I suppose we used to call educational technology, but for me, it's just technology, assistive technology, ed tech, all of those words, but technology for education and outcomes, uh, I suppose, for nearly 20 years now. The last, I suppose, seven years of that have been with a company that you mentioned, which was Text Help. And I suppose seven years ago, that was my first opening to UDL and trying to understand UDL and where it might fit. And I know you have a global listener base, but I think it's really important to stress that from a UDL perspective, it was always seen very much by us Europeans here as a sort of North America centric framework or structure and not something that many of our teachers or educators had talked about or had even implemented, of course, here on this side of the Atlantic. So seven years ago, I started really on the UDL path of trying to understand how we can talk about UDL specifically for me with my expertise through the lens of technology. And for me, that's really driven by my very sort of firm commitment through those 20 years of technology of inclusion in the widest sense of the word. How can we make sure we include every single pupil or student, not just those pupils who we can identify with a specific need, but those pupils that maybe fly a little bit under the radar. And UDL for me was really that almost that perfect encapsulation of what we could do in terms of a framework that wasn't prescriptive. And since then, I've been leading sessions, fortunately enough to do those globally, workshops, hands-on and in-person, I suppose really just evangelizing about UDL and bringing it to as many people as I can across the UK and Europe and showing them that removal of barriers through UDL can be a very, very powerful thing in their classrooms. A banner detailing universal design for learning guidelines with three color-coded brain icons symbolizing engagement, representation, and action and expression, each with respective descriptive texts. That's wonderful. Two things that stood up for me. Not prescriptive. Yes. So on the same plane with you, and so is everybody else who truly understands UDL. So it's not prescriptive. It's giving us all of these opportunities. But then I also loved your word of evangelizing. <laughs> we are there together too, talking about. I think it's really important, you know, because I think the challenge in education, particularly for people like me, whose job has been for so long to go around and talk to people about what they could or should or might want to implement in their classroom is you can fall into that acronym land of and then you get the rule eye emoji equivalent in a room where people go here's another new yep. thing and I've always been very clear to stress that UDL is a framework it's not prescriptive it's not restrictive it's a new way that we need to bring thinking of course we all know about the checkpoints and the balances and everything that we have within the wonderful framework but it is that and I think that's very important because a lot of people think you're bringing them something brand new and you're asking them to change fundamentally everything that they do in the classroom and of course you and I both know that's not it. Yeah exactly it's providing that safe space and safe understanding of recognizing oh oh here's what I'm doing that links and then oh here are a few things I can start with 
that align with the framework, but make everything so much better for so many more students. And also, I suppose, and I guess we're going to touch upon it later, but recognizing the good practice that you're already doing that aligns or fits within the framework and building on top of that as well, I think is a really important step. There are things that we commit to as educators, things that we do on a daily basis that actually are clearly part of the UDL framework and how we approach our learners. And so I think that's important to always recognize through these workshops and these events that that I speak at. Yeah, I absolutely, absolutely agree. Well, we are focusing on that big question of can we grow UDL organically? But of course we have... (laughs) such a short amount of time. So we're going to try this. We're going to do our best. But this question stems from work that you did and you've done with a group of schools who adopted one-to-one, which for those who aren't familiar with the term, each learner has a piece of technology hardware that they're using in the classroom. But they did not partner that, their one-to-one adoption with UDL in the beginning. They did, though, eventually add it in. And I know there's more to that story. So That's where we'll get started. So sharing some of that, getting it set. A wall-mounted acrylic sign for the Leo Academy Trust, featuring a colorful lion illustration and text outlining the organization's mission, vision, and values. Yeah, and I suppose as a a backgrounder to that, because again, I know you have a global audience, Louis, but in the UK, and I talk specifically about England, so the bit in the middle, for those of you looking at a map, we talk about England, we have a system of schools there, which are part of what we call multi-academy trusts, and if you're listening from North America, that's basically like a very, it can be a very large school district equivalent or a very small one, in this case, this group of schools is seven schools, they're all primary and they are called the Leo Academy Trust. And one of the things they did just pre-COVID, so just in 2019, was make a commitment to this one-to-one device rollout that you talked about, Louis, <clears throat> which effectively was a Chromebook for every child, upper ages of primary, and a tablet device at the, the very youngest ages. And it was very much a technological commitment to the school to look at digital skills and future learning. What it wasn't, and they'll very readily admit this back in the day, it wasn't a view on how can we make our classrooms more inclusive. It wasn't a view on special education needs or SEN, as we would talk about here. And it most definitely wasn't a view on UDL. It was about technology in the hands of learners and improving the general, I suppose, attainment outcomes or skills for those pupils across primary. And so that is really four years old up until 10 or 11. Three professionals in a meeting with a colorful brainstorming chart in the background, laptops and paperwork on the table, immersed in discussion. And so we embarked on a journey with them. They adopted some of the text help tools throughout that as a way to leverage some of those digital devices. And sort of past COVID, as we kind of got enveloped in technology for technology's sake almost. It was a means to an end. We needed to have that in place and things like Google Classroom started to get embedded. It was very clear that whenever schools came back just after that, that they wanted to formalize what they were doing. And they embarked on effectively a two-year longitudinal study, an impartial study with an academic, Dr. Fiona Aubrey-Smith. And we were fortunate to be involved in that. And What happened throughout that time is we observed throughout the sort of two and a half years of that project that whilst it didn't start out as a UDL piece at all, and it definitely didn't start out with an inclusion piece in in our, I suppose, our definition of the word, but it started to move and we started to see an involvement in the classroom and in the approaches that the teachers were taking that made the classrooms ultimately far more inclusive ultimately removed an awful lot of barriers through technology and other things, which maybe we'll come to, but also things like at the end of the project, the register of special education needs that that trust had, those seven schools, went down by a factor of a third in the time frame where they adopted these strategies. And the need for what we call LSAs, learning support assistance in the classroom, also went down by the same level. And what it's got down to is with effectively embedding UDL across that period of time and more inclusive practice, you know, you're now in a, in a one of those wonderful situations, Louis, that you can go into your classroom, in any classroom, in any of those schools, and it is absolutely impossible to identify a child, a pupil, a student with any specific learning needs or any part of the special education needs register because kids there have ultimately the opportunities 
to use the tools that benefit them. A teacher and students in red uniforms using laptops in a classroom filled with educational materials. They have a significant amount of barriers removed in their day-to-day -day learning and it's very much focused on pedagogy. So whilst it didn't start back in 2019 as we're going to implement UDL, it very much got to a point through the strategies that were put in place to drive inclusive practice that actually it's a really, really, really fine example of how the UDL is now put in place. And to the point where in the early days, we wouldn't necessarily look at the CAST website, we wouldn't look through the UDL guidelines, but working through on professional development and identification of removal of barriers and moving from sort of that differentiation post-learning approach to removal of barriers and learning design at the start, that the checkpoints and the guidelines became a very, very important part of both professional development and the culture within the trust as to how teachers would actually approach their design for learning. And it was really, really fascinating to see because I think, as you and I have talked, we talk a lot about sort of, not necessarily using these words, but deliberate implementation of UDL and a very defined strategy to get our teachers and our colleagues and our, our wider stakeholders and our school systems on board. And that can be a challenge when we're the person driving that. But this happened incredibly organically for lots and lots of different reasons. Two young schoolgirls in red sweaters and white shirts work together on a laptop in a colorful, busy classroom. Uh, so I'm guessing that people who are listening to this, and I get a mix of listeners based on the feedback, and so some people that are really deep users of the framework, and then of course those who are just brand new to this. But I think a question that's going to be popping up for everybody is, was there a sense, was there a feel for when you actually, you and others actually first uttered the phrase universal design for learning? Because like you just explained, they were already starting to think about and using strategies that drove inclusive practices. They were already moving into that mindset of removing barriers from the beginning. And they'd started down that path, but at some point, universal design for learning was introduced. Was there a certain feel? Was there an assessment of what teachers were doing? Because you had this wonderful collegial partnership with a researcher. How did that work? Yeah. And Lou, I actually remember the day that happened. Um, oh. it, was, it was that sort of specific. And what had actually happened is I've been working with the trust for a while and I'd noticed lots of really good things happening, which were quite subtle. But for example, how they prepare their space. So if you think of a, a set of schools that goes one-to-one, -one, everybody has a device, okay, all good. But they had put simple things in place where they said, actually, every child has a device, but every child now needs to have access to their own individual pair of headphones. And they also said, every child also needs to have access to a stylus within that. And those are very interesting, tiny, subtle changes. But what was clear to me when we talked to them was that was almost unintentionally removing barriers because they said, we want choice. If you want to listen to your text read aloud, you can pop your headphones on. Everybody's got a pair of headphones. Nobody's going to make a difference. Or a child may be using headphones a different way. Same with stylus. Some pupils will want to write in a jotter or a workbook. Other pupils want to write on screen. Other pupils want to use their fingers. Other pupils will want to type. But the choice was ultimately there. And I saw the same through their approach to the tools that they would use. So they might have a modeled piece of learning at the front, but they'd have a very, very flexible approach to the types of resources that pupils could get access to. And also the types of assessment pieces that pupils could follow through to, you know, complete a wrap through to type up a document through to complete a video. But ultimately the choice for those younger pupils was in and around how they wanted to interact with their learning. And I remember getting um, the leadership team on a podcast, not dissimilar to this, Louis, and talking them through those various steps that in their head were revolving around inclusion. And I asked them how they looked at the UDL framework. And at that point, they actually hadn't. They'd come across it, but they hadn't looked at it. And we were able to go through each of the steps that they've done within the classroom environment 
and actually align it perfectly with so many, initially those three core boxes that we all know of UDL, um, those multiple means areas. And we were able to literally come out of that podcast the far end, uh, understanding that actually there was a lot of good UDL practice was going on. It just wasn't formally tied to the guidelines and the structure. And it, there was a pivotal point for them to recognize that they were doing things well, and it had been unintentional and organic, but now was the time to step in and announce to the world that they were going to pursue a UDL model within those schools. And PD changed because of it. The approach to learning, the attendance at conferences, the interfacing with people like yourself and global educators doing wonderful things with UDL. And it changed quite dramatically when they literally put a label on it. You know, you and I, Louis, we don't like labels on a lot of things, <laughs> but this was the one time where there's a formal approach to making this even better and building on the good practice. Patrick, with raised hands, speaking at a conference, with a sponsor banner behind him and a laptop on a podium to his right, followed by screen captures of the UDLapproach.com and the UDL in 15 Minutes logo. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And yes, you and I don't want to put the labels on, but this is the good label. Uh, yeah, one of the uh, phrases that you used, their work was revolving around inclusion. And I think that when that is the heart, when that's the center, that we can grow UDL organically. So I love that they shifted. They were working with the one-to-one, -one, which we know can be really valuable for our learners. We know that those can be helpful tools and partnering that up with the right software. But then, of course, we have to partner that up with the right pedagogy and we have to partner that up with the right mindset and revolving around inclusion was just a beautiful partnership or triangulation of those three things and then I can see how that created that pathway to UDL. Yeah and I think the important milestone for them and I've seen it with many others as I'm sure you have too Louis and your great work is that when you kind of try and help people redefine what inclusion is, too often in, in workshops and events, right, talk about inclusion and it's seen as inclusion is somebody else's role, right? That is for a subset of the mm -hmm. children that I work with. And all of us that practice UDL, that we balk against that and we push back against it. But I think one of the most important things we can do is try and redefine for those schools that may be on the cusp of UDL or in the middle of UDL, or again, unintentionally rolling out UDL organically, is redefining what inclusion actually is. It's not about just that subset of learners that you've particularly focused on in the past, let's face it, providing accommodations to. It's about removing barriers for everybody. And I, I understand I'm preaching to the converted, for want of a better phrase, Louis, but I think it's really important that in our work, you talked about evangelizing. I'm very, very passionate about UDL, but inclusion is what underpins that passion about UDL. And I think you need, we all need to be talking about inclusion in the widest possible sense because it does have to be everyone's responsibility and not fall into the trap of it's only a subset of people have to embrace UDL or embrace inclusion or embrace special education needs and diversity in our classrooms. And that's a real driver. And I think that's what happened certainly in this trust is eventually they came to the conclusion that inclusion was genuinely about all and not simply including the marginalized or those who had who were struggling with a specific need. Absolutely. That's a beautiful shift. And it's the shift that we want more and more people to make. Patrick, thank you so much. Our 15 minutes have absolutely flown by. We knew they would. And I think this has been such a rich conversation and big takeaways for people. But here at the end, landing here, and as you said, redefining inclusion, helping people understand that inclusion is including all learners. And that's because we're all variable. It's because all learners are variable learners and everybody needs those opportunities for that flexibility so they can grow. Uh, Patrick, thank you so, so very much. You've been so kind throughout the entire podcast. Thank you for sharing your wisdom and your experiences. And I can't wait to talk to you again sometime. Thanks, Louie. Appreciate the opportunity. You're welcome. So for those listening to this podcast, you can find supplemental materials like an image montage with closed captioning, that montage with audio descriptions, a transcript, and an associated blog at my website, which is the udlapproach.com forward slash podcasts.
And finally, if you have a story to share about UDL implementation for UDL in 15 minutes, you can contact me through the udlapproach.com. And thanks to everyone for your work in revolutionizing education through UDL and making it our goal to develop expert learners.